Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly broadcast. So glad you could join us today. We are excited about the, what the Lord has given us concerning his word. And if you've been following us, we've been in the book of John. So we are currently on chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 25 today. So if you have your Bibles with you or you're following along, again, that's John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. And today we're going to be examining what God has to say about the temple. And uh, this is very interesting because this uh, is an episode that uh, speaks about uh, Jesus cleansing the temple uh, on his way into the very uh, beginning of his three and a half year ministry uh, here on earth. He only did it twice. He, he did the cleansing when he first started the ministry and he uh, again did the cleansing the last week of his ministry here on earth. Very vital, very important, very strong truth to be dealt with here. And I really believe it's going to be a blessing as we dig into this. Amen. So if you look at the title, you know, you see it's the temple of the true temple of, of God. And we're going to looking at be looking at what they looked at as the temple in the Old Testament and what we should be focusing on as the new temple and the New Testament. So let's look at verse 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money ch changers of money and overthrew the tables. And a lot of people will use this particular um, circumstance to say, well, you know, the, Jesus got angry. So, you know, and turn up tables and threw them at the temple. So I have a right to do the same thing. But you have to look at the background of why he was angry, what he saw in the temple and why he um, made such a scene, because he was wanting to make a point about what the temple of God was truly for. And when you look at this, you begin to realize that uh, he was angry for the Lord's sake or for mm -hmm. God's sake, his father's sake, because they had done something that was really immoral with what God was trying to establish as a flashpoint uh, for his righteousness. Okay. And when you began to examine this, you began to realize that, um, that when it comes to taking this example of what Jesus did, you need to keep it in the context of exactly what was going on. And when you dig into it, a lot have said, well, you know, this proves the theory or the concept that you shouldn't sell things uh, in the church or the church shouldn't have uh, a lot of business going on in the church. Well, you'd have to go back to the book of Leviticus and, and parts of De Deuteronomy mm -hmm. and examine them to see the the principles laid aside concerning the temple and concerning uh, how you would handle uh, going before the Lord to understand what is going on here. But as you begin to examine this, you come to the realization then that they were out of place. Mm -hmm. They were not to have been in the temple doing what they were doing. Right. Uh, a lot of these activities were to be done uh, prior to coming uh, before the Lord, and, and they were to be done outside the perimeter of the, uh, the uh, inner courts of the temple. So you begin to realize right away that, uh, that some of the concepts that we have concerning the holiness of God and concerning merchandise and concerning buying and selling, we need to recognize that you can pull the scriptures out of context to make them say whatever you want them to say, mm -hmm. but it's wise. It's the only true way to study the Bible is Look at the context, dig into what God was really trying to uh, portray to us and recognize we have customs, we have traditions, mm -hmm. we have different things that go on that, that, uh, that we have to recognize are not necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but can be wrong because of where it's being done. That's right. And I think about when I look at what Jesus did here, it was a time and moment when the Lord actually rebuked me because I remember, you know, naturally, I'm a, I call it a clean freak. And naturally, I'm always seeing something that needs to be in order, you know, or needs to be clean. And he told me, well, that same energy that you use to naturally see things that are out of order, you know, not in just your life, but in others. He said, that's the same energy you should be using to examine your spirit man, your temple. You should be always on alert. Is that in order or that out of place? And make sure you're using the word of God to get it in order. But this is the thing. He's talking about the natural temple here, but we also need to recognize that in the new temple that we are of the Holy of God, that there's things that we need to do to make sure we keep our temple in order, our temple clean and meet for the master's use. 
So you begin to wonder then, how do we come to an understanding of the temple mm -hmm. being what we relate to the temple as of today? That 15th verse says, he made a scourge of, of small cords, and he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep, the oxen, and poured out the changes, money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, or take them out of here. Make not my father's house mm -hmm. an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house uh, hath eaten me up. And this, of course, is talking about the 6th to 9th Psalm. But, but when you begin to examine this, he was moving into a position. Mm -hmm. of presenting to them a brand new understanding as far as it comes to God's temple. When you begin to examine this, you begin to see him exercising the authority that he had as the son of the living God to actually lay out the true uh, concept, the true understanding of, of temple worship and of what goes on in the temple, what is permissible and what is not permissible. When we begin to look today at the way we operate and function in the body of Christ, it would do us well to examine our purpose and our reasons for some of the things we propagate in our churches and among our congregations. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize right away that not everything that is uh, permissible uh, is in the right place with the will and the purpose of God. Recognize that some things just don't belong in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to look at the old concept of what uh, the temple is, then you can understand why it was so important. Mm -hmm. uh, you began to recognize that Jesus in this episode was making preparation mm -hmm. for a new dispensation concerning the temple. Right. Uh, you'll find that uh, when you examine the, the, the temple, it was uh, uh, built by Solomon and it was a great temple and it was just uh, very lavish and it, it had a very prominent place in the religious folk of that day. Mm -hmm. But now here comes Jesus on the scene, and uh, they had gotten so comfortable doing certain things to make it more convenient for them to to, to uh, take advantage of some that were really less fortunate than others. Mm -hmm. And this is not the way God operates his program mm -hmm. of, of grace. This is not the way God is in the kingdom. Recognize that God is still God, mm -hmm. and he operates in such a manner as to make sure that no one suffers because of their economic backgrounds uh, in trying to worship and trying to uh, fulfill their uh, their requirements of God toward him. Amen. And it takes us, take me back to what we talked about last night in class of, about the reason why do we come to church? Why do we come to the house of God? It should not be to socialize. It should not be to commerce, but it should be to worship God, to come together collectively and expect the supernatural things of God to happen, to expect miracles, to expect healings. That's why we should come to the house of God, not to do all these extracurricular activities because there's a place for that. But when we come to the house of God, we should come with one thing in mind and that's to give God glory to see and expect God to do the things that he's already promised in his word because we're now on one accord in one place just like they were in the um, day of Pentecost so this helps us to, run, to remind us that why are we coming and our focus should always be on worshiping God yes you may see your neighbor yes you may you know socialize but should that be the focal point of why you come to the house of God if not if your a focal point is not worshiping God and expecting God to move in a space your way we should really reevaluate our mindset not our neighbors but why do you come so you can be a participant in making sure this atmosphere is set for God to do what he wants to do every time we come together yeah, and, and you know there's another spirit that has actually uh, encapsulated the church mm -hmm. that is very troubling there's this thing about money this mm -hmm. thing about finances and this thing about dealing with uh, us being the head and not the tail and being very prosperous. Mm -hmm. uh, God wants us to prosper. He wants us to operate uh, in such a manner that we lack for for nothing. But, you know, as we look at what he was dealing with, Jesus was dealing with here, these were, were scammers. These were uh, mm -hmm. those that took advantage of others, those that made their fortune off of uh, misrepresenting or deceiving others and taking 
uh, using religion as a means of actually uh, uh, profiting themselves. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new. This is going on in the in the church back then, in the temple back then, and it's going on in the church today. Okay. So when you begin to look at certain principles that God's laid out, it makes you begin to examine a lot of things. Now, there's some that are saying now that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be held to to tithing and giving offerings in the church. That these things are not legal, or these things shouldn't happen in the church. They're under the law. They say it. They use different other excuses. But listen, when you rightly divide the word of God, then there is a place and a, a position that God has for everything necessary for his body. Right. When you begin to, to examine the scriptures, for example, tithe is not something that came about because of the law or under the law. Tithe operated uh, uh, with Abraham. Abraham, uh, whenever he defeated the kings that took uh, Sodom and Gomorrah captive, when he came back, the Bible said he tithed to Melchizedek uh, on the way back. And uh, this was some 400 years before the law. Now, you think about this. Abraham is considered to be the father of our faith. As a matter of fact, you'll find in the Bible uh, in, on several occasions that, especially in the fourth chapter of Romans and, and uh, also the third chapter of Galatians, you find that, that, uh, that we are the seed of Abraham. We are the children of Abraham. By faith, we are actually entitled to every blessing that Abraham uh, was promised by God. Now, that's faith, and that, that we accept that. But we have a problem accepting the fact that ties is a faith principle, mm -hmm. not a law principle. Right. That simply means then that, uh, that you can't use it to be uh, a, a gauge to the far right or the far left or recognizing that, hey, this is the, uh, if you don't tithe and if you don't give offerings, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. There's no other way around it. Well, that is not found in scripture, That's right. especially under the days of grace. You know, you, uh, you, you, you may be a believer that does not uh, do, do don't believe in tithing or don't believe in giving offerings. Well, that's you, and uh, it, it's not going to keep you out of heaven, mm -hmm. but I believe it's going to keep you away from some of the benefits of prospering here on this earth God's way. Uh, another thing the far left says, well, you know, uh, when, it, when it comes to, to tithes and offerings, none of it's legal, none of it should be done, mm -hmm. uh, you should not have anything to do with any of it, and that's not true either. Right. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where it tells us that we are not to give. As a matter of fact, 6th chapter of Luke said, Given it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. Mm -hmm. You'll find also in uh, uh, in the uh, First Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about how God loves a cheerful giver. How you're not to just give anything but purpose in your heart. What you're going to give and how God gives seed to the sower. Mm -hmm. right. So all of this is in the scripture. Why can't we come to the middle of the road? Mm -hmm. Examine God's word and recognize, no, we will not go to hell if we don't give tithes and offerings, That's but right. we will be hindered in walking in the fullness of what God has for us according to faith in this day, in this period, and in this time. Mm -hmm. The second thing to, to recognize is uh, we should not be trying to make men and women keep this particular uh, ordinance of tithes and offerings. This is something you've got to do from the heart. You've got to want to do it. You've got to believe that you're going to uh, prosper according in the scriptures for well, when you do it and it should not be done to try and, and pump God up or pump God up or make God do something in your behalf. It should be done from a heart of love, yes. from a heart of understanding the things, things of God and wanting to make sure you have your part in, in guaranteeing that God's will is done on this earth. Amen. And I wanted to read that verse 17 in the Amplified Version because as you were talking, I, I like the way it says it's concerning zeal. It says, his disciples remember that it is written in the scriptures zeal or love or concern for your house and its honor will consume me and this is talking about the concern and honor for God's house and when you have concern and honor for something you treat it differently it's a reverence so just like giving and tithing you don't give thinking well you know um, it's not um, where well, you're not cheerful but you do it as honor as a concern for God's house knowing that you're contributing for the fullness for the completion of God's house and that verse 18 says 
Then the Jews retorted and said, this is still the Amplified Version, what sign or attesting miracle can you show us as proof of your authority for doing these things? So, you know, then they were like, well, we want proof that you have the authority to do, to do what you're doing. And, you know, that's just so carnal. It's just like carnal people. You know, you can't go if you're a police officer and you do not have your uniform on or you do not have your badge. There are certain things you cannot tell people and they believe you because it's like, who are you? You don't have the authority to tell me this. But Jesus and who he was was trying to explain to them. I am the one that was promised. You know, you are turning my father's house into a, div, a den of thieves, and this is not right. So here we have them wanting to see a sign, wanting to see a miracle. You need to show us what authority do you have? And we have authority in Jesus' name now. We don't have to explain, but we know that in Jesus' name, that we have the authority through his name to make sure everything around us is in order, the Bible way, the, word, the way the word tells us it needs to be. You'll notice the next verse, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Mm -hmm. uh, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will uh, thou rear it up in three days? Mm -hmm. But you see, then it goes ahead and explains. It says, But he spake of the temple of his body. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Jesus is changing the entire concept of temple worship, mm -hmm. of what the temple is for and why the temple exists. All of a sudden, he is letting them know that the temple is the old dispensation, the way they're looking at it, that he is the new dispensation of grace mm -hmm. and the truth of God being operated and in the right manner toward uh, God's temple. And that he said, firstly said, uh, said I, in essence, he was speaking that I am the temple of God. Mm -hmm. He said, you take this this temple and you crucify it, you destroy me, and in three days, he said, I'll raise it up again. He was saying, in essence, uh, that I came to be a sacrifice for the offerings of the entire world, and he changed the whole understanding of the temple of God. All of a sudden, now for the first time ever, the temple is, is uh, being recognized, uh, especially uh, by the disciples, as not being a building, mm -hmm. but being an individual. So when you begin to look at that concept, uh, think about this. Today we spend so much time trying to beautify edifices to worship God. That's we true. have uh, so many times certain denominations that say, you can't be saved unless you're in my denomination. Mm -hmm. There are certain other ones that say, you know, you got to be in a certain city or in a certain country, mm -hmm. or in, in a certain place in order to uh, to pay homage and honor to the temple of God mm -hmm. and to really stand upon uh, uh, honoring and glorifying God concerning the temple and making the proper sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to look at what Jesus is saying here, he changes the same, the, the the, the strange understanding that we had once before mm -hmm. concerning being a building. And now he lets us see the concept of the temple being a person. That's right. And it's two, in two places in 1 Corinthians. First is in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. And it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. But I like the way it's uh, referenced in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So it reminds us that we are, our body is the temple of God, and we are not our own. So we can't treat it as our own, but we, again, we have the reverence that we have something supernatural, someone supernatural inside of us. And when you look at it that way, you treat your body different. You have, your whole life is different because you know that you have something supernatural on the inside of you. So you don't harm your body. You don't do things to your body that will hurt your, your or, or cut your life short, so to speak. But you realize, I've got to take care of this temple, mind, body, and soul, because it houses the, the spirit of God. And when you look at it that at that, you live a totally different life. And you're not so much concerned on the physical things, but you can concern how is my spirit am i maturing am i really in the center of god's will for my life am i really making sure that the spirit of god is comfortable dwelling inside of me yeah you know when you begin to examine it to its fullness you begin to come to the reality mm -hmm. that uh, you're not saved by going to church mm -hmm. you're not saved by worshiping a certain in a certain place 
or in a certain building. That's right. You are saved through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And instead of going to the temple or going to the church, you become the church. So the church is not a building. The church is not brick and mortar. The church is men and women who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We are the church. We are the temple of God. And many times we're trying to fill up buildings with the Spirit of God. We're trying to fill up special services or special meetings with the Spirit of God, not really understanding that you are what God wants to fill. You are who God wants to use. You are the one that should be honored. Honoring God, you don't honor God just by cleaning up a church building or honor God by cleaning up a certain place that you're going to have a service in. You honor God by allowing God to clean up your life. You are the temple of God. You are the church. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism. That means we are alive. We are like the natural body. We are members one of another. You say, well, where did this come concept come from? Where did this understanding come from? It started with Jesus. Jesus said, I am the temple. Mm -hmm. He said, you destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Well, it was. They did try to destroy the temple and the Bible tells us that Jesus' life was not taken. He gave it up. The Bible said on the cross, he said, it is finished and then he gave up the ghost. Of course, he was resurrected and brought back from the dead and now is exalted in, uh, to, with, to God in heaven and seated at the right hand of the throne of God, but he started a brand new dispensation. Mm -hmm. The seventh chapter of John makes a statement when he's dealing with the woman at the well. She is saying, well, now now, uh, now that I've got your attention uh, and you're a prophet of God, I need to ask you something. She said, where's the right place to worship? Yes. She said, do I need to, uh, do we worship here in Samaria or do I worship where you, the Jews, say we are the worship? Where is the right way for me to worship God or to make the proper sacrifices to God? And Jesus told her, he said, you need to understand the time is coming. And then he said, I can tell you that time has already arrived. The time is coming and right now. Uh, when they that worship God must worship him in spirit mm -hmm. and in truth, mm -hmm. in spirit and in truth. So you begin to realize right away that uh, to worship God in spirit and in truth doesn't mean you shout all over the church. It doesn't mean you jump the pews and, you know, have a great uh, uh, Holy Ghost time in the church. That's not what he was talking about when he said worshiping uh, him in uh, uh, in truth but what he, and in spirit. But he was saying it's inside of you. Yes. It's, it, the way we worship God now is we carry him inside of us. We are the temple. So everywhere I go, the church goes. Right. Everywhere I go, the temple of God is there. I do not have to go behind a special curtain to be in a holy yeah. place with God. I do not have to go to a special location or a special place. But wherever I am is a holy place for the presence of God because he dwells inside of me. Recognize that God's temple is you. You represent the temple of God. You cannot be saved by going to a building, but you can be saved by allowing yourself to become that building of God. Amen. Now, if you look at verse 22, which comes after the part when he says that he spake of the temple, his body, it says, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said unto them and believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they believed because they remembered that he had already spoken of this. He had already told them that he was going to have to give his life for our sins. He came to save the world. So they remember this and they believe. And this is what we have to remember as far as living for the Lord. God will, you know, in his word, he tells us certain things will happen. And sometimes it it takes us longer to be convinced because we, we feel like, well, no, it, it's not going to happen that way. But if the word of God says it, it shall be fulfilled. Just like scripture had to be filled, fulfilled when Jesus was here. They didn't want to believe that he was going to have to die, you know, a suffering death. But He, the word of God had to be fulfilled. And when they remember what he said, they believed it because he, they saw him resurrected. They remember what he said about the temple, you know, destroy it. And, you know, I'll raise it back up in three days. And although initially they were thinking that it was a physical 
physical uh, building, they realized here, no, he was talking about himself. And they understood and they believed. And this is what revelation of the word and understanding of the word does for us. When we come to an understanding, this is what God is saying. It's not about the things I do. It's about why I do it. It's not about, you know, doing the right things or making sure, you know, the salvation is what me makes me do the right things. Being right with the Lord in my heart is what makes me do the right things. It's not so much my outward actions or as it is my inward intentions. Am I sold out to the Lord? Am I listening for his voice, making sure I'm going in the direction he wants me to be and realizing, like Apostle was saying, I am the temple of God. And when I realize that I'm doing the things the right way, according to the word, according to the truth, the Bible tells us that God said, I will separate them. And it's the word of God. It's the truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus said, I will give them thy word. Thy word is truth. That's what separates us. And that's why how we can worship in spirit and truth, knowing that the true way to the Lord is one way, and that's Jesus. And, and, and you know, um, we need a gathering place. Mm -hmm. and, and God lets us know that when we come together, then we come together to, to uh, uh, actually allow ourselves an expression of who we are. Mm -hmm. In Christ Jesus. When you begin to look at scripture, it says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together mm -hmm. as the manner of some is. But just remember, you are not assembling mm -hmm. yourselves together to celebrate a building. You're not assembling yourselves together to celebrate a particular denomination mm -hmm. or a particular man or woman. You are gathering yourself together to celebrate God and to have an opportunity to rub elbows with those who uh, have the same anointing that you have mm -hmm. or those that are born again as you are. Whenever we get into a, a, a building, we should not be try to be uh, individuals who are trying to call the power of God down, we should be men and women who are allowing the power of God to come out of us. You see, uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, I'm going to pray to Father that he send you another comforter. And when he is come, he will abide with you forever. We're talking about the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. And then Jesus made another statement. He said, if you will obey me and keep my commandments, mm -hmm. then he said, I and the Father will come and we will make our abode with you and we'll sup with you. So you see, See, you're talking about having God on the inside of you. So for me to try to call God down when God is already in me is for me to just waste a whole lot of energy and effort trying to do something that God has already done. For me to try to position a, a, a particular meeting or a particular service for something unique and special for God to do or to propagate is for me to actually operate uh, a little contrary to what God has shared with us that we have on the inside of us. Where is the temple of God? Where is the holy of holies? Do I need to find a holy of holy place uh, uh, to really be in a good place with God? No. You are the holy of holies. God is living on the inside of you. Right. So you can have church right there in your house, right by yourself. You can have a great big deliverance meeting if you're into deliverance meetings, right there in your car or right there on your job because deliverance operates from the inside out, not from the outside in. That means that you are delivered through the new birth. You are delivered through being born again. Your deliverance did not come from the outside in. Your deliverance came from the inside out. Right. I believed on the Lord Jesus in my heart and I confessed him then with my mouth and then I'm saved. So it's from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Recognize that the authority you walk in is not an authority that you paid for. It's an authority that Christ purchased on the cross and he now allows you to do what you do mm -hmm. being an instrument of his glory. Amen. Now, verse 23 says, and this is Amplified Version. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identifying themselves with him after seeing his signs, his miracles, as he was doing. And then it says, but Jesus, for his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew people and understood. This is the part that I wanted us to understand. He understood the superficiality and fickleness of human nature, and he did not need anyone to testify concerning for him, who, who he was, 
because because he knew what was in man and in their hearts and the very core of their being. So God knew what was in man because, you know, he created us. He is our father, so he knows. And so I like the part that says that he didn't need man to promote him. He was already promoted by the father. He was here to do the father's will. And he understood because of the fickleness of man, because of the superficiality of man, that he couldn't depend on him. And we have to understand the same thing. Yes, we love, you know, our brothers and sisters in Christ and we love each other, but we also have to understand understand that our weakness in this flesh is that sometimes we are, you know, we're not dependable, but we have to remember who is the dependable one. And that is Christ. He is the one that will never let us down. He is the one that is not changing. And at the same time, we can, just like he understood, we can understand and not hold it to each other's charge. But remember, what is our mission? What is our goal here on earth as believers? Recognize right away that uh, when it comes to man, there's not a whole lot that man can do for you. But when it comes to God, everything that you need can be found in him. Amen. He's a great God. He's a glorious Savior. He is someone who you can trust. When it comes to trust, recognize that your trust should always be in God. Now, we've got men and women of God who are, are very trustworthy, and they're very dependable, and they're very loyal, and they will do God's uh, will in spite of of what they desire to do. And, and and we're not going against that or speaking against that, but I'm just saying recognize that if you put all of your confidence in man, mm -hmm. then sooner or later man is going to let you down. Mm -hmm. But when you put your confidence in God, put your confidence in him and who he is, then no matter what man does, you will never be on a, a, a rim of being let down because you know that man is subject to being human and subject to failure, but God never fails. Recognize that principle and, and don't become uh, prideful and bold and arrogant and saying you don't need uh, nobody but God. You don't need man because God placed it in such a position in his kingdom that your, your glory in God, your growth in God, your maturity in God is dependent upon men and women who he has actually ordained to bring forth that uh, that uh, maturity in your life, but in the when you really get to the bottom line of things, you follow them as they follow Christ, and you recognize that your confidence is not in them, but your confidence is in the God that's in them, and that way you keep your focus on God and not man. And whatever you do uh, in behalf of man or to man, let it be as though you're doing it to God. Mm -hmm. Recognize he is the very center of your will and your purpose and your glory of worshiping in spirit and in truth. Amen. And we have to remember, like the lesson says, that we are the temple of God. And of course, you know, uh, this Old Testament, it was a building. New Testament, we understand that we are. And I wanted to read the second half of the scripture I mentioned before in 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So God looks at us as holy. We are his temple. We may not feel like we're perfect enough to be holy, but that's what how the Lord sees us. He sees us as his temple. So let's start treating it like we are the temple. We are the, uh, the temple of God is on the inside of us. So you begin to come to the understanding then that promotion comes from the Lord. Don't you ever forget it. Promotion comes from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, you can promote yourself. Man can promote you. But the anointing will not be with the promotion. Mm -hmm. One of the signs that you've had the proper promotion is when you walk in the proper anointing. Mm -hmm. And you operate in the proper uh, wisdom and obedience toward the things that God has entrusted to you. Understand this, when it comes to God, when it comes to the temple of God, we are now in the dispensation of grace. And the temple is not a building, it's not a place, it's not a certain circumstance, but the temple is men and women full of the Holy Spirit and in the will and purpose of God. Amen. Recognize that and accept that. Just remember, darling, as greater as he that's in you than he that's in the world and with God, all things are possible to them that believe. God bless you. We love you. Looking forward to being with you in our next broadcast together. Amen. God bless.